Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and I'm doing yet another movie review this week of a film that came out in 1982, which happens to be a very peculiar, strange, and um, very obscured fancy adventure TV movie that aired on CBS back in December 28, 1982 based on the novel of the same name by Rona Jaffe you know, which is about um, an accurate newspaper stories about the disappearance of James Dallas Eckford III from Michigan State University in 1979 you know, which also deals with uh, the controversy behind all this which leads to the very most popular successful you know, role-playing board games of all time called Dungeons and Dragons which started in 1974 and became very popular ever since despite of its uh, controversy so they finally uh, fixed the situation yeah which involves um, James Dallas Eppert III and another kid you know, who both had committed suicide due to it which in reality of uh, William Deers, the private investigator on the case of on the death of Epper, it actually turned out that prior to all the events and and that it actually occurred beyond the myths in the media, it actually turned out that he actually committed suicide mostly from peer pressure involving the parents as well as the drugs and all this mental issues it's been going through. Yeah, even though the parents had believed it all caused from the obsession of the, the game itself, which apparently, you know, leads to a lot of evangelists, you know, many parents, a lot of church groups, the whole entire media claiming that that the game itself is based on upon the worship of the devil, witchcraft, and all this other stuff. Well, since this game itself had a lot of dark stuff, you know, as well as the monsters, the dragons, of course, and sword and sorcery, and, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't meant to take itself so seriously. That's just the whole purpose of the game. It was supposed to be a fun game. You know, you'd never get tired of it. You always want to imagine that you're actually in that century and you're actually teaming up to go against them. Yeah. And that's pretty much what leads to all this addiction that made it possible. Yeah. Anyway, the movie is called Mazes and Monsters. Yeah. Which, believe it or not, it stars Tom Hanks in one of his earlier roles behind his first current role. Um, a very short one of that called He Knows You're Alone, yeah, a horror film, along with the TV series Blues and Buddies, in which he co stars with Peter Scarolli, yeah, which only lasted for two seasons. It's Wendy Crewson, who's been in several pictures you know, throughout the years, including The Santa Claus, and of course, who couldn't forget The Good Son. She also went on to do another film that that was very similar to Mazes and Monsters called Skull W. Yeah, you know, once again another movie that you know that plays exactly like another Dungeons and Dragons type of story. Yeah. But, you know, in fact the funny thing is the eighties sure had a lot of you know game related movies you know, that follows. And there's so many of them hard to believe, yeah prior to the fact that this was the same year that Tron came out. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big year, I guess. Anyway, David Wallace, Chris Makepeace, who's been in the two films already called Meatballs and My Bodyguard. He, he later went on to do the Nickelodeon series Going Great, which came out in the 80s as well. Pretty rare show. Lloyd Bochner, Peter Donat, Anne Francis has been commonly best known for a role in, in Forbidden Planet 
as well as the TV series Honey West. Came a long way from that. Murray Hamilton, who played the mayor in the movie Jaws. Vera Miles, best known for the role in Psycho. Chris Wiggins. Kevin Peter Hall, who later went on to do the role in Predator. Yeah, he played the creature, by the way. And Louis Scorrell. It's written by Tom Lazarus, who later went on to write the screenplay and produce the film Stick Mata from 1999 with Gabriel Byrne and Patricia Arquette. With Ronan Jaffe, who also co produced the film. You know, since she wrote the novel. And it's directed by Stephen Hillard Stern. The movie begins, which actually started repeating the same scene, occurred at a crime scene in which police investigators, including the reporter, were trying to search inside the cavern to find a missing guy who may have been told that he actually played a game called Mazes and Monsters. Earlier in the film, a kid named JJ, who's played by Chris Makepeace, and no, not JJ from Good Times, or even JJ the Jet Plane. No, this kind of JJ. Well, once he finally came back after he graduated, he actually feels marginalized by his mother, who basically is a decorator, when he wants up with decorating constantly throughout his entire room and apparently yes I did not make this up but his entire room looks exactly like a mental ward hospital and it even looks like it too once it's designed this way and yes um, we even get to meet uh, JJ's bird a parrot named Merlin you know, named after the magician and basically you know, his lines he says in the film is is this Birds don't talk or Happy Halloween Yes. The bird pretty much says all of this stuff. <laughs> also the fact that JJ always wears a lot of hats. Um, whatever kind of hats he wears. Sort of in the tradition of that character from I Love Lucy, you know, the hotel manager and that one episode where you know, Lucy and, and Ricky were were not legally married after trying to renew a marriage license. Yeah, this is definitely one of those characters. Okay, when he finally uh, came to uh, Grant University for his new semester, his colleague and best friend named Kate, who's played by Wendy Cousin, has a series of failed relationships. She's also a writer, too, as well. And yeah, she's also making all these conversations with her mother. Now, Danielle, who's played by David Wallace, who's having conversations with his parents about rejecting his dream of becoming a video game designer. Well, you, in the 80s, you really get a lot of stuff like this. Kind of reminds you of what's going on today, isn't it? Yeah. And Robbie, who's played by Tom Hanks, in a very odd choice of uh, of his appearance but he is Tom Hanks by the way no doubt about it yeah he lives with an alcoholic mother who's played by beer and miles and a strict father who fights constantly about what's going on in in the game that he's playing which happens to be mazes of monsters and he's still being tormented by the mysterious disappearance of his brother named Hall who actually had explained in the movie that he was missing during a Halloween party and kept dreaming about him all the time yeah imagining about actually seeing him you know inside a huge tunnel that shows the person you know, wearing the cape who might have been his brother so he's like yeah the, the leader of you know trying to help him fight against it all of them are, are big fans of the game Maze of Monsters, which definitely had causes Robbie to be kicked out of his last school and became way too obsessed with it. And boy, was he ever obsessed with it. So, you know, as a result of this, 
he finally came into the new school, you know, just, you know, studying and doing all this other stuff until he actually found a sign on the on the bulletin board involving the, the game and thought maybe he might be able to join in as the fourth player since he's the very dominant one during the party. They decided to meet up and they wound up uh, being together talking about already up to the ninth level of the game. He was going to take a break from it, but you know they're just telling him, warning him about this, and he decided he'll he'll just give it a shot, and he did. So during that same night, they want to play in the game, in which um, the entire room is overly bright but very dark and murky. The yeah, overly bright with those uh, candle blows. They started um, going through the course of the game, you know. And suddenly, uh, Robbie and Kate had begun a serious relationship with each other, which he, of course, still has nightmares involving you know, his brother being missing, and so on and so forth, which um, eventually uh, causes uh, JJ to be feeling very upset and feeling very left out out of his friends. And in fact, his journey, of course, was to commit suicide in a local cavern. Yeah, apparently, yeah, this, this is, all this is actually based on true events, that, or what it seems to be, as occurred to all of this, you know. Yeah, one of them is going to actually commit suicide, and another is just going to, you know, do the other side of it. Like, they're going to start being schizophrenic, yeah, and all this other stuff. Everybody's hallucinating about the monster and everything. Well, his plan didn't work out until he finally uh, decided to change his mind and use the cavern to be simply, you know, at, once they started playing the game continually the very next day, he decided that his plan was to play the game for real. So they did, actually, by going straight to the cavern and decided to bring, you know, all the costumes from a theater drama class. Yeah, so they figured they matched all of them. And they went inside the cavern, you know, bringing in all of the, the equipment they need, even the, the lamps. And they're trying to see uh, what's going on inside while they're actually playing the entire game particularly. They spotted a skeleton with a flashlight that's opening on, on his mouth. Although I have to admit, there was one scene in which Robbie actually said, get this, beware the sacrilege. That's right, beware the sacrilege. That's what he actually said in the movie. Yeah. This movie probably would work well if they started playing it as a drinking game. Don't you think? Now, I don't drink alcohol on any of this stuff, but this movie would be better off as a drinking game already. Yeah, we would have fought. And then there are a lot of crazy antics that's been going on, including Robbie, who actually finally had the experience in the game, where he actually spotted a monster, and it was dressed by, uh, I guess, to Kevin Peter Hall. He had one of those psychotic episodes as he finally slain the monster, as he imagined it. So, yeah. And of course, the monster is called Corvell. At all this time, he actually believed that his character, the cleric Pardul, who's the holy god, leads him to break off his relationship with Kate, and decided to draw some maps that leads him to a sacred person he has seen in his dreams, which might be his brother in the skies, and he's also referred to as simply the Great Hall. So at this rate, his plan was. He was telling them to go to the, the two towers, which apparently, yep, based on the the name after J.R. Tolkien from The Lord of the Rings, which it turns out that the two towers, and you're going to love this, and I think you're going to be prepared for this one, even if you haven't seen this movie. I mean, in this generation, you're probably already going to feel very shocked. Okay? It turns out that the two towers 
is actually in New York, which is the Twin Towers. That's right, the World Trade Center, which we already know the story behind the World Trade Center. Yep, the event that occurred back in 2001, yeah, September 11. Yeah, I know I have to mention this, but yeah, I haven't seen this movie. I think now we're already having this uh, issue. He actually believes that by jumping off the tower, that he'll actually cast a spell, and he'll finally join the Great Hall as a result of this. But of course, that would probably lead to suicide. So anyway, his friends had reported him to the police while concealing the trip into the caverns, trying to look for him, but no such luck since he's missing. So they went straight to New York, which apparently on his on his quest, though, he actually winds up killing one of the street muggers who was actually going around attacking him. Yeah, he was trying to run for his life, and, and little did he know, he actually hallucinated the, one of the muggers, thinking that one of them actually might be the monster. So apparently, he uses his sword and actually stabs the mugger. And, and that's where, you know, suddenly, you know, he started making a phone call, trying to escape, already filled with blood on his hands. From stabbing him and he was um, crying out on, on the phone talking to Kate that he's actually there and he and he actually he didn't know what he was doing at, uh, at this rate he didn't know he knows that he's in New York and, and he's at the, the corner but unfortunately he didn't knew that all this time he he remembers uh, what he was doing so he knew he had one of those those psychotic episodes. So once um, Kate found out about this, he decided to call his friends on a search for him all the way around New York. So they had to go all the way searching from from uh, building to streets where uh, after all of this, you know, JJ went inside to his apartment just to find out if, because he always has that, that issue with his mother redecorating his his room and everything, and yep, his room turned out to be even better than before, <laughs> and, he, and, he's, and he loved it. Meanwhile, Robbie went down to the subway tunnel where he actually meets a street bum claiming that he's the king, and he's still trying to look for the Twin Towers. Yeah, he was asking some questions and everything like that, yeah, very strangely. And the fact that he's hearing the noises from the background of the subway trains. He thought that these noises were actually the dragons. But I know. I know dragons do not sound like that. That's how messed up this movie really is. Looking at all the maps, trying to figure out all the clues on where to find Robbie. And it turns out that, yep, after all this time, they were thinking that the Two Towers is the Twin Towers. So once they, they go around the entire building at the World Trade Center trying to search for him, and I, I know some of the scenes were repeated too, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, where one of them says door closed. Once they finally found him, he actually uh, tries to attempt to jump off of the building, yeah, claiming that he's going to fly. Well, apparently. All three of the fans decided to, uh, just to help him out, just pretend that they're actually one of the players and telling him to, to stop jumping because you're going to lose points. And this is where he screams that line. JJ, what am I doing here? I don't remember. That sort of way. I, I mean, yeah, th this is Tom Hanks you're talking about. One of the most uh, talented actors of all time who actually won two Oscars for his performance in Philadelphia and Forrest Gump and did a lot of, a lot of stuff on his resume, you know. And he winds up in a film where he's attempted to jump off of the World Trade Center. What the fuck? am I seeing here and yeah keep this in mind this is 1982 
I guess we never knew who at the time who Tom Hanks was unless you watched Boozing Buddies. Because this had to be the most messed up thing I ever saw from a movie. Even for him. And frankly, I feel sorry for him when he got involved in this, this whole ridiculous uh, story. Yeah. Which well, going to lead to the ending of the film. Uh, someone claimed that there was also another ending. Like maybe an alternative ending, but I, I'm not so sure about this. I think this was the only ending I saw uh, after uh, looking for it. But at the end of the film, boy, not only was the ending depressing, but it's also... I mean, I know it tries to be a happy ending, and, and I think it, it did turn out to be one at some point. But it's also bullshit, uh, in my opinion. He started to play in character. I mean, they found out that he's fine. You know, he's he's going to back to normal in some sort. You know, he's already not going back to class because of this. Since he had to go see a doctor you know, every month now because of what's going on with his uh, schizophrenia that he's been getting. You know, because but he also found out that you know that all three of them had nothing to do with him. You know, he's been going through this all this time. He plays the same character that he'd been playing since uh, he started playing that game. Once again, staying in character as Perdue, you know, all three of them, you know, tell him that to, to stop joking around, you know, they all think he's nuts and everything. Well, they started going in character once again, and, and then as, as he talks about, you know, the river and everything, they finally went into it, you know, continue talking until you hear Kate's narration about well we play the game again we fight out all the monsters and everything and then we only play it only one last time and that's it and then the movie ends and boy um, this had to be the most disappointing film I've ever seen even for a TV movie and it just goes to show you how lame the writing and this whole fuck up media that they keep doing these days really occurs what's wrong with this picture um, yeah I mean not only is the writing bad but also um, the acting was very uh, very cheesy and corny and, and very uh, and at times very bad especially to Tom Hanks who's, who's usually good in so many movies but in this one he just feels like you know he's really out of it it's such a shame though because he, he deserved better than this it's because this movie did have a connection to something the fact that uh, one kid JJ who's who as we claim in the film that he has an IQ of 190 sort of had a connection to uh, to Tom Hanks role in Forrest Gump where he actually had an IQ of 75 and then there's also another connection where where he went up top on the Twin Towers, yeah, one of the towers, yeah, World Trade Center, a connection to one of his later films in which he actually gets killed in an airplane with Sandra Bullock, yeah, the mother and father of this young kid in Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, got killed in, in the plane which went straight to the towers. And here's another connection. The title, Mazes and Monsters. It almost sounds like another Dan Brown adaptation. Yep, in which you know he played that character in Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons. And yeah, he's going to continue to follow that story um, as all the other films are coming up um, in the coming of years. Yep, there's going to be more of them. Wow, go figure. I think maybe Tom Hanks had some rough times at the time, long before he wants up having his success with, with Splash, Big, and all these other films that he's been doing in his career. In fact, Bachelor Party is is even way better than this movie. Tell me about it. I mean, and I love Bachelor Party, by the way. Yeah, I, a very funny comedy. And all these other films that he's been doing. I mean, this movie is just as depressing as it can get. Um, Wendy Crewson 
um, I had to say she was sort of a bore in this movie, and, and um, all the other characters were uh, e even um, JJ were wasted. And to make matters worse, all the parents that you saw in the movie looked like they'd been signed in for paychecks or something like that. Either way, it's really annoying. I mean, it was also a shame that you know, Anne Francis got signed up for this. And she deserved better than that. I mean, I know she's no longer with us, but boy, this was a mess. In fact, I, I know a lot of people compare this to Reefer Madness. I mean, when it comes to so bad it's good type of films. And all this propaganda stuff. Well, that's true. It did felt like Reefer Madness in that sort of way. But in comparison though, this is like the social network. Yes, I have to use the 2010 film to be part of this. This is like the social network of role board game movies that I've ever seen. Because of course you do get nerds you know, playing a game that's very popular. Exactly the same way they, they go on social networking like Facebook and Twitter. I know, I'm sorry I had to compare this movie to its today's stupid technology, but <laughs> what else is new? Because it's always the nerds. <laughs> and as a result of this, this movie was pretty boring. Also, it's also very bland. There wasn't anything too exciting about other than the fact that we got to see the cheesy monster and the costumes they wear and the fact that they're playing the game and all that. But, I don't know. I mean... This is not something I expected from Tom Hanks. I mean, and, and he deserved better than that. And so is Chris Make a Piece and even Wendy Pussy. It's just... I, I don't know. And plus they even had a theme song in the movie that seems like it's borrowed from Linda Ronstadt or Karen Carpenter type of music that they chose. I know the 70s and 80s had music like that, but... For a film like this, who would imagine? Yeah, and the song was called uh, Friends in This World by Judith Lander, which the music is by How Good Hardy. Yeah, I find it hard to believe that the screenwriter who wrote this mess went on to do Stigmata. Yeah, which is another terrible film. And Mona Joffa, who already passed away already, must have wrote a crappy novel. In fact, I think she might have been considered as the Stephanie Meyer of the 80s. But I doubt that, that she had any fragments or any of this bullshit. So I don't, but although I never read the book, but I bet the book might have been something interesting. But at the same time, it's, it's a rather ridiculous application. So it's... <laughs> go figure. But this whole story, you know, went to... Uh, went to a halt and they already, you know, solved their case or some sort or anything. But you know, if if I would have known better, I say they would have done a rewrite on this. Why not have uh, the young kid uh, JJ become one of the ones with schizophrenia instead of uh, Tom Hanks. I mean, he's the oldest of the group for crying out loud. But I guess, you know, they wanted to cast him in this ridiculous story because they couldn't do anything about it. I mean, why can't they do a lot of that stuff? I mean, I, I don't get it. That's that's just basically my problem with this movie. Too much anti-role-playing. They, they think this whole thing is, is worthless. If you ever see this movie, I mean, they do have this on DVD. Um, you can find it at stores like Walgreens and all those other places, even the 9 and Cent store, Dollar Store or anything. Yeah, they, they always have them on the shelves. You can even get it on Amazon at this rate or any other. I mean, if you want to see this movie. I mean, it's also available online, too, if you get a chance. But this is the kind of movie it's, you, know, you might have a risk taking. But, but on this rate, um, I would recommend it for everybody who loves Dungeons & Dragons. Um, or any other game that you grew up with. Or even Tom Hanks, for that matter. 
if you're a big fan of Tom Hanks, uh, then this movie's not for you. I'm sorry. I mean, I love Tom Hanks. He's my favorite actor. He's been in a lot of great movies, no matter what. But this movie, I couldn't take it. In fact, it almost makes um, those two films look good in comparison. Even the... H hell, e even the bonfire of the bandities look better than this. <laughs> and that was a terrible film, by the way. Um, which apparently he was miscast in that movie. Yep. The Brian De Palma movie that's based on the novel. Yeah. Because this movie just couldn't take it from me. Okay, well, that's Maces and Monsters for you, then. I'm going to give this movie a very depressing TV movie of the week. One and a half star. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.